is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What's going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. And today we are previewing UFC 249 with Barry Cohen of NumberFire to get his thoughts on how you bet UFC and who he likes for this weekend. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, sports kind of trickling back now how you doing today i'm doing pretty good yeah we got some ufc this weekend korean baseball is uh starting to play god bless them for figuring out how to test massively and do contact tracing and all the things they're doing over there <laughs> um and yeah nascar is coming back for you next weekend so oh my gosh yeah and Not- i saw some th- this morning the bundesliga is yep. trying to come back by the end of the month and you know what that means just Lots of data in empty stadiums. And I'm sure that you are just ecstatic about the possibility of having that data. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I'm not ecstatic about going and getting the data, but True. Um, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to look at. And, you know, while I have that data, you know, I can actually run some numbers about, um, you know, how good teams are as well, which, which I may or may not use. But yeah, no, it'll be, it's good to get something back. And, uh, as we head towards hopefully a football season this fall. Yeah. Well, we'll see about that. Uh, But getting power ratings around the KBO, that'd be amazing. Uh, Have you picked out a a KBO team to root for yet? Cause like, I have not educate me on who I should pick. Okay. So I, I am a Minnesota twins fan, which means in theory, I could root for the LG twins. uh, But I'm actually drawn towards a former twin, Byung Ho Park, plays for the Kai Wum Heroes, and so I'm okay. kind of leaning that way. Uh, but I think that for next week, that could be your homework: is to find a yeah. KBO team to root for. Either that, or find a, a favorite NASCAR driver. Maybe we can get that cooking instead. Yeah, that would be good. Both those things would be good. Yeah, and we've—I mean, it's nice to have these sports back, but like, it's good to have the optimism around UFC, NASCAR. There are rumors about major league baseball maybe being back july 1st uncon very much unconfirmed and sometimes refuted rumors but hey you know i'll take whatever <laughs> i can get football's a, a yeah. tougher sell uh for me yeah. to get behind right now because it's just so many people Ed. i think that that's a, a major complicating factor especially for like college when like you kind of need all students to be on campus there you go in order to There's like sell thing. it yeah well no <laughs> You need all students to be on campus. I think you need to give them the option to be on campus in order to make it a something where you can like still still attempt to sell amateurism. And like we can debate whether or not they should be saying making that argument they're amateurs to begin with, but it would really kill their argument, which would be hilarious if they had college football while not having campuses open. Right. I mean, they're not going to have that, right? Like, I I mean. University of Michigan is not like canceled all summer activities, yeah. which I presume means that the football team can't come back and train. And until the football players can get back on campus and start to train, you can't even talk about having a season. I mean, I suppose you could they could get back in August and you could throw them on a football field for a game. But I don't I don't think that's going to happen because yeah. you would see more injuries than you're probably going to see already. So. At least for the University of Michigan, like we're talking about kids getting back on campus to start training in September. Like that, that would be a good thing, right? Like that would be the very optimistic scenario. So I realistically think like our best case scenario for football is that the NFL will figure it out this fall. They'll get it done, figure out the testing and how they're going to go about that, play in empty stadiums. And then college football uh, kicks off as soon as the Super Bowl is over in February. And, like, uh, that'd talk- be fine. I'm not going to complain about that. If we get football for from September <laughs> through, like, yeah. May? No, and it'd be really Sign sweet. Me up. <laughs> because, like, because I don't, I don't watch enough. I, I Well, I would like to watch more NFL in the fall. Right. But that, you know, trying to hang out with my family thing kind of gets sure. in the way because I do right. spend a lot of time on Saturday watching college football. Right. Um, to have nine months where you're, you're having, um, you know, just one league to follow would be right. – would be pretty awesome. Obviously, like it would suck to not have college football this fall. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, even in terms of this podcast, right? Like, I think it would yeah. be great to like just focus on one of the footballs at a time. Sure. Uh, could even throw some other things in. Uh, so, 
I mean, I honestly like I think that's the best case scenario. Like I don't I don't think college sure. football's coming back before the spring. I just I don't see it happening. Maybe they could split a season, play four games in November. Yeah. Play the rest of the season later. Um but you know, and this is this is really the best case scenario and this is all contingent on not having another outbreak. Right. And it sounds like projections of when there'd be a vaccine like early uh, this would be like January. Um that would be a mer- that would be correct. a miracle. Correct. That they didn't get started working on a vaccine. Miracle. It's like 12 to 18 months is usually the projection, I think. Um, but I was worried initially about college football because, like, I love having college football to watch on Saturdays. However, once you put the idea in my head of having football from September through May, I'm kind yeah. of infatuated with that, that idea now. And I'm like, kind of cool. You know, there are worse things. So if that's what it comes to, we'll be all right. Uh, but. It'll be interesting to see. At least we have some things to hold us over uh, until then, but um, yeah. it'll be fascinating to see how all this plays out. Hopefully some miracle happens. We don't have to worry about it, but the idea of a perpetual football season is not, you know, it's not the worst thing. That is for sure. I mean, it would be interesting to see if, like, college football ratings, like, jump 30% in the spring. And I'd have like, to imagine oh. they would. The XFL <laughs> got ratings. The XFL was a terror. Uh, I don't want to say it was a terrible product. It was not as aesthetically pleasing as the NFL, and people didn't have the allegiances they have to the XFL that they do in college. Sure. So I feel like you take the XFL ratings, which were good. They were very good yeah, uh, relative to other sports, good. and you jack those up X percent. I don't know what that percentage would be, but like I think they'd be sitting pretty for sure. I know. Well, I mean, and that's – okay, so we get to this best-case scenario. We're sitting here a year from now. We're going to watch the college football championship game. And everyone in the NCAA is like, hmm, you know, there's going to be the pressure this. not to put those kids out on the football field again in three or four months. So perennial spring college football. I don't know. There'd be I a lot of timers that would be against that. But, I you know, and a lot it. of people in the Midwest <laughs> that would, uh, you know, not, you know, when we do get back into stadiums, they don't really want to go to the home opener in February in 20 degree weather. <laughs> But, you know, that's I mean, very true. You know, it might be one of those things where just the TV money, you know, if, if your TV money, if your TV contract is going to be 30, 40 percent bigger. Right. Why not? Let's Why not? roll. <laughs> It'll be fun to see for sure. Uh, but obviously a lot bigger issues to tackle before then. But we'll see how things play out. As mentioned, we're going to talk with Barry Cohen. Uh, find him on Twitter at ScaryBarry4. We're going to break down UFC. Barry is a writer for us at Number Fire. He'll have a betting guide up on numberfire.com later this week. We're talking UFC 249, how you bet UFC, because I frankly have no idea. So we're going to have Barry explain that to us and have him break down his favorite bets on this card. For those of you who do know UFC and want some insight on the actual matches themselves, Barry will go through that as well. Last week here on Covering the Spread, we talked to Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus, uh, discussed the betting fallout of the 2020 NFL Draft. I also talked with Scott Warfield of NASCAR. He is the director of gaming for NASCAR. Talked about the intersection of iRacing, betting, NASCAR. Uh, I talked to him at like 3 o'clock on Thursday, and then at like 3.30 they announced that NASCAR was resuming, so slightly poor timing because I could have talked to him about that had I known that was going to be happening that afternoon. But uh, still, I think good insight from him about the future of betting on NASCAR and markets they'd want offered and things like that so make sure you check out that and the chat with uh with eric eager by searching for covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts apple podcasts spotify stitcher google play store we are all those places and if you like what you hear please leave a rating and review as well FanDuel sportsbook is now available in colorado but what's a sportsbook with no sports well it's actually FanDuel anything book FanDuel's newest free game Each day, you'll pick one free prop, like the weather, stocks, anything, and pick it right to win 5 bucks in site credit, and then play again tomorrow. Play FanDuel Anything Book Free only on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21 plus, max bonus is $50. Visit FanDuel.com slash audio for terms. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. Let's bring in Barry Cohen now to break down UFC 249 and get his thoughts on this card as sports start to kindle back up this weekend. Covering the present. Let's bring Barry Cohen into covering the spread. Barry, UFC 249 coming up this weekend. How are you doing today? 
I'm doing a lot better now that we got this coming up. I cannot wait for this. What has the sportsless life been like for you for the past, <laughs> I guess we can say almost a couple of months now, because it's been nearly two months. What have you been doing to occupy the time? It is a lot of waiting, and then we got tempted with the UFC card a couple of weeks ago, so taking that away, and now it's back. Um, but it's been nice, just uh, relax around the house, and the closest thing to watching sports, we've had uh, the Michael Jordan coming back, so we got yeah. a little taste so far. Yeah, a little taste, uh, but this will be the full-on action, and it seems like a really good card. So I'm going to dive into this card here for UFC 249, and I... Don't know a lot about UFC, so we're going to ask some very basic questions of you, Barry, because I'm assuming a lot of our audience, too, probably hasn't bet UFC all that often. So let's just start with the basics here. What are the key markets and the big markets you can bet when betting on UFC? Absolutely. Um, and I think we'll welcome a lot of new bettors to this for this one. So the primary bet is going to be your money line, um, just who's going to win the fight straight up. And it's you know not like NFL or other sports, really, where you're looking at a spread too much. Um, and then there's the inside the distance or whether the fight goes to decision. You'll hear it called by both of those. And that's just whether the fight is going to be finished inside the three rounds or five rounds for a championship fight. And then you also want to look at those for each fighter. Um, if you have a fighter that you think is going to win, maybe look at him. Is he going to win inside the distance or by decision? And then if you think he is going to finish the fight, you can also take a look at is he going to win by knockout or submission? Cool. And for you, which market do you tend to find the most success in? Are you mostly going with the money lines, or do you like to get into the more in-depth markets to try to find some inefficiencies there? I tend to look at the money line for my primary bets. I like to look a lot at the number for the fight going the distance. That will kind of tell you if they are expecting a finish or not, and you can kind of go with your bets from there. But I don't <laughs> typically bet that number. And then for this fight, card since we do have a lot of big favorites i found some in there that i'm going to look at fighters winning inside the distance excellent so barry we're a, definitely a data-driven podcast so we really like to know what sources that we can get to, to help with research uh what statistics matter for you and and how do you go about finding them so a lot of people might not equate ufc betting with looking at the numbers you know they kind of just look at it as a fight but there are a ton of stats that you can get a lot of information out um, I look at the UFC stats site. It used to be called Fight Metric. You can start there with just fighter records and their info, you know, their reach, the basic numbers about them. Um, then you want to also look at average fight time. Um, that can tell you all, a lot about, if, you know, how long they've spent in the octagon, which tells you, you know, how long they've been around. Um, but also, are their fights ending within a minute? Are they like a knockout artist? Or do they tend to go the distance, like we talked about above? And then also their striking and grappling numbers, um, average strikes per minute landed and absorbed, and then as well as wrestling and takedown numbers, and then finally um, submissions as well. So when they get to the ground, how often are they going for submissions, or are they just staying in top control? Um, also like the UFC stat leaders, stat leaders UFC. Um, that one has a lot on this card. We have Donald Cerrone, who holds probably more records than anybody in the UFC. He has the most wins, total fights, finishes, knockdowns, and he's one shy of the most knockout wins. Um, it also tells you the longest average fight times, which is Dominic Cruz, another one of the fighters on this card. And the guy he's fighting, Henry Cejudo, uh, one of the records he holds, he has the second lowest bottom position percentage. So he does not spend a lot of time with a guy on top of him on the ground. Um, things like that can tell you a lot about the fight. Um, and in the main event, Justin Gaethje, he has the most strikes landed per minute, 8.57. So things like that on the stat leaders at UFC.com, you can all obviously tell a lot about whether a fighter is a striker, wrestler, what you're going to expect when they get them in the octagon. So when you're looking at the data, are you mostly using that to inform what type of fight you're going to see and what the matchup looks like? Or are there certain numbers you can turn to to know quality of fighter? Is it, is it more matchup or quality that you're gleaning from these stats? A little bit of both. Um, you're going to learn a lot about the fight if you have a, two guys that are throwing a lot of strikes per minute and also absorbing them. You can probably write off most of the wrestling or anything for that fight because they're probably just going to be standing up and hitting each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you, you can look at a fight and see a guy with a lot of wrestling stats uh, versus a stand-up fighter, you can kind of tell the storyline of how that fight's going to go. One guy's going to try and take the other guy to the ground. The other guy's going to want to stand up and not get taken down to the ground. 
So it tells you a lot about the fight itself as well as the fighters. And then you can kind of dive in to if you see a guy that is, you know, he's an up and coming prospect, he's doing really well, but you see his average fight time is really low. He's just knocking guys out really quickly. You might want to go ahead and dive into some of his fights before the UFC and see, okay, this guy is really great at knocking people out. But what happens when he doesn't get the knockout and he goes to the second round? Um, so it might just even tell you that you need to look a little bit more into a guy. Yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I'm I'm definitely interested in kind of styles of fighting, uh, particularly after the Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder uh, fight. You know, they were even odds heading into it. Uh, but Wilder, Wilder is known as the knockout artist. And he came in and wasn't able to knock out Fury. Uh, Fury... I think is known as the better boxer and he was able to, he pretty much dominated the match. Um, so do you side with guys who are just better fighters as opposed to knockout artists or w what is your perspective on that for UFC? It is interesting. You, you, you really want to I, at least identify where they are. Um, and you can kind of look from the early days of the UFC. That's kind of how it started. Um, the submission artists and the grapplers really took over and dominated it rather when People came in just as boxers or strikers. Um, they couldn't really hold up. Now it has evolved, and there are different kinds of styles and different things work for other people. Um, I think the wrestlers are really taking over now. And you can look at things like that, too. Like if you have a submission artist, they might be really great. But if they're up against a wrestler, well, they're not going to be able to take the guy down. So what good does their submission do? So it really tells you a lot about how a fighter is going to match up with his opponent. So you're saying right now it's more... Because aren't the submission guys, aren't they going to be the better wrestlers too? Is that how to think it's about it? a little bit different. Um, the wrestling is a lot about you know getting taken down and taking the other guy down. Uh, whereas the submission stuff kind of starts when you're already on the ground for the most part. Um, you can do a lot of submission standing up. But... A lot of people are going to favor a lot of those. Um, the knockout artists, basically, you're looking for a knockout with them. Um, and when they right. come up against a guy that they're probably not likely to lock out, you might want to stay away from them a little bit. So are there, you may have kind of just covered this in a way, but are there some types of fighters, some archetypes that are like bad matchups uh, based on the way they fight? And you may have, again, just kind of alluded to this, but are there some archetypes we should look be looking for as being bad matchups, quote unquote, bad matchups for other types of fighters? Absolutely. Um, kind of the one I touched on earlier with the grappler versus the uh, wrestler, we had um, Damian Maya, who's widely known as one of the best grapplers in UFC and MMA history. Um, and he set the record for most failed takedown attempts when he took on Tyron Woodley. He simply just couldn't take the guy down. He was a wrestler. Uh, we also have a pretty good example in this one. In one of the heavyweight fights, we have Alexei Olenek. Um, he is just a complete submission artist he, he basically wants to s submit anybody he fights which is fairly rare for a heavyweight um but he's going to be going up against fabricio verdum now who might be just as good of a grappler against him and is also probably better in every other aspect of the fight too so when you ha we're going up against a guy who can take out your one dimension and even beat you with that and he's better in pretty much everything else too you can see why verdum is a minus 330 favorite there uh, let's break down two of the bigger matches on this card, the two headliners here. Starting off with Tony Ferguson against Justin Gaethje, who you had alluded to before as being a big striker. Ferguson, minus 174 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Which side are you favoring here if you see any value in that line at all? Okay, well, the first thing I see is just fireworks. This, <laughs> but you don't want to blink during this one. Um, I am slightly leaning towards Tony Ferguson. He is a guy that has been up around the light, the, sorry, the lightweight championship for a while. He's, this is not his first time fighting for the interim belt. He was supposed to fight the actual champ, Khabib. This would have been their fifth time, um, but that couldn't go. So I like him there. Um, the odds are, are pretty good on this one, so you're not really finding much value. But when I'm picking a side, I am going to go with Ferguson. Um I touched on earlier Gaethje throwing the most strikes per minute in UFC history. He also absorbs a full strike per minute above that rate. So this guy does not care about getting hit. He's already said this week that he's hoping his nose gets broken. Um, he is an all, he's a former All-American wrestler, but he refuses to wrestle. He, he wants to entertain the fans. He has zero UFC takedowns. Um, Ferguson is throwing 
5.81 strikes per minute, or sorry, landing. So it's three less than Gaethje, um, but of course he's absorbing way less. Um, he is willing to go for the takedown, not too much. Uh, 0.56 takedowns per 15 minutes, uh, which would be a three, full three-round fight there. Uh, but the other big thing with him is he's averaging 0.88 sub attempts per the trip to the ground. So if it goes to the ground, he's likely to go for a submission attempt, um, which is interesting, too, because saying Gaethje's a wrestler, he's not going to be likely to start wrestling now because when he goes to the ground, he's going to be at a disadvantage there. That's so, really interesting, the background with Gaethje uh, not wanting to wrestle despite being so uh, so good at that. How does that influence the way you look at him as a better? Is he more volatile because he he uh, operates that way, or I, I just, it feels very interesting that he he willingly chooses to go that route? Absolutely volatile, <laughs> and this is not any secret or anything. It's probably brought up in every interview that he ever gets. Um, he just he wants to entertain the fans. He likes to stand and bang. It worked for him. He was you know came into the UFC undefeated. Started off pretty well there, but then he ran into two guys that hit pretty hard in Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier. Um, and he has said recently that he might go to the wrestling and do that a little bit, but I, I don't see it coming in this. I'm expecting chaos in this one. So the other headliner is Henry Cejudo versus Dominic Cruz for the Bantamweight Championship. Cejudo is, uh, is that favorite in this one. How do you see this playing out? Um, this one is another one where I think the the odds are are pretty spot on. Um, I like Henry Cejudo. I think the line is um, higher than I like, um, but I can't have everything I have, so I'm gonna stick <laughs> with Henry Cejudo there. This is a, it's a wild fight. Um, Dominic Cruz is coming back from an almost three and a half year layoff. If you want to look at from perspective, if you look at think of the last time Ronda Rousey was in the UFC. Dominic Cruz was the co-main event to her main event on that fight. That's how long ago it's been since this guy fought. Um, if he has taken a two-year break before, this guy gets hurt a lot and has returned to a top level. But he's coming back after three and a half years, and he lost his last fight to Cody Garbrandt. So this one is very interesting. Um, on the other side, we have Cejudo, the, the side that I like. This is only his third fight in the UFC at this weight class. Uh, he was the champ at the weight class below this. And now he is, he came up, he won the belt, he defended the belt, and this would be his second time defending the belt there. And he was actually supposed to fight Jose Aldo. Um, but he'll be taking on Dominic Cruz here. I don't think it's too, he's four inches shorter and he's given up four inches in reach. But the last two guys he fought at this weight class were three inches more reach over him as well. And Cejudo, he had a little bit of weight issues um, at 125 as well. So at 135, he it might be a good weight class for him. Um, looking at this one, Cruz and Cejudo, this is a lot more likely than the last fight to actually go the distance, even uh, though it's a full round, full five round fight. Cruz has gone the distance in 10 of his 13 UFC and WEC fights. Um, one technical decision, one doctor stoppage, and one knockout. No submissions there. And six of his last seven fights went five rounds. So Cruz is no stranger to the five-round fight. Um, Cejudo has only been the five-round distance one time. And he actually has three knockout wins in his past five fights. And those are across two weight classes. So an interesting one there. He is plus 280 to win by knockout in this fight. Um, like I said, he's done it three times in his past five fights. He's fighting an older fighter who is coming off a three-and-a-half-year layoff and some injuries. So that's a number that I do uh, want to take a look at in this one. I, I like that a lot. How much does the uncertainty around not knowing what kind of shape a guy like Dominic Cruz is going to be in influence your willingness to enter markets around a fight that involves him? It is, it's a big influence. Um, he is an absolute professional. He is a UFC commentator, so you probably see him around a lot. So it's not like he's been away from the game. Um, he has good training partners. He's over at Alliance MMA with a good team. And he, he came out, like I said, he took this fight as a replacement out of nowhere uh, after being off for three and a half years. So there's clearly something that he likes in this matchup. He went out of his way to choose this. His name wasn't even coming up. So that is really the number one thing that's scaring me in this matchup is he is clearly confident that this is something he can win. Um, 
but it it just does it, it's weird it, he's three and a half years away i i can't really take a bet on him there well i think another aspect that's interesting here is it's not just this card that we have for usc we have another card coming up i think middle of next week and there are smaller cards that aren't going to be as as much publicized coming up in your experience do you find more inefficient lines on those less, I guess, public, maybe the way to say it, those less public cards, do you find better lines available there just because they may not be as heavily bet? Absolutely. Um, like I said, this one has been coming together and been canceled on and off for so long that I think the lines are kind of settled in. Like I saw Francis Ngano earlier went down to minus 250. He didn't even sit down for a cup of coffee and was already back up. Um, so I don't see... <laughs> too much value strain around here uh whereas those smaller cards especially with them just coming together short like a couple weeks before the fight uh i think there's going to be a ton of value coming up on those and there has to be an influence that like this ufc main event is coming in a sports betting desert for everyone else right so there's probably a lot of people looking to bet this probably making the more lot the market more efficient absolutely um it's the Oh, well, I guess the, the Korean baseball is taking the world by storm right now. But uh, the UFC is the big thing on right now. And we've been looking forward to this for so long that it's hard to find value on this card. The high womb heroes, man. We got to we gotta get behind them. Uh, with Jungle <laughs> Park. Let's go. Um, so we have 10 other fights on this card on Saturday. So pretty wild, uh, a wild selection here. Any other stand out to you as having advantageous betting odds right now? Absolutely. Um, so I think I have already touched on it. This heavyweight fight that is third from the top. I can, I've been waiting for this for so long. Um, it's Francis Ngannou versus, uh, Jair Rosenstruck. And this one, we talked about the odds of, um, fights going the distance and things. This fight is minus 380 to finish inside the three rounds. So it, they're basically expecting a knockout. Um, I like Francis Ngannou to win. Minus 270 is probably about right for where he is. But with the minus 380 line inside the distance, this fight is very likely to end inside. So I'd rather take the number at minus 175 for Francis Ngannou to win inside the distance. I am leaning towards him winning by knockout, but he does have he can win by submission. Um, and the number by just finished winning um by knockout wasn't really too much better for me. So I'm going to stick with inside the distance at 175 for Francis and Ganu. Um, I think the guy Rosenstruck that he's fighting is pretty much a lesser version of Francis and Ganu, which is quite a compliment unless you're going against Francis and Ganu. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also like uh, the very first fight on the card is a big one. It's uh, Ryan Spann versus Sam Alvey. It is a huge line. Spann's minus 410 to win. So if you want to throw that in a parlay, you could. I think he's pretty much uh, squared away that he's going to win there. But the distance between minus 410 to win and minus 145 for Span to win inside the distance, I think is huge. And I really like that. Um, Span has gone the distance one time in his four fights between the UFC and the Dana White Contender Series. And that includes him taking out Little Nog and Emiliano Sorti. He subbed Emiliano Sorti in under a minute. Um, Sorti just ran the table and won a million dollars in PFL last season. And the guy that spans fighting, Sam Alvey, he's been around for a while. He's been knocked out twice in his last three fights, including one of those knockouts was by Little Nog, who, like I said, Span knocked out in the first round. So I really like Span minus 145 inside the distance. Uh, for an underdog, uh, we can go over to the uh, women. This is in the lightest division. Um, these They're at fighting at minus 115, Michelle Watterson and Carla Esparza. I like Watterson, the plus 136 underdog. This fight is actually um, on the other end of that Ngannou one. This fight is minus 400 to go the distance. So it's very likely that this one goes to decision. So you can also get Watterson at plus 210 to win by decision. I like that one as well. And then we have uh, Vicente Luque and Nico Price. These guys, I, I don't know why this fight's happening. Um, <laughs> Vicente Luque already beat him by second round submission in October of 2017. So I don't think much has changed there. Luque's honestly gotten better. Price is kind of a wild fighter. Um, he, he, he's getting better, but I don't really see much there. So I like that a lot. It's Luque minus 270. 
Um, you, it, that would be one that I'd probably throw in parlays to or j- just take straight up. And then I touched on uh, Fabrizio Verdum earlier, just kind of being better, especially at uh, Alexei Olenek's strength. And then I'm still on the fence um, with Uriah Hall. I think there is a little bit of value. I think if his number goes up and he becomes a bit of a bigger underdog against Jacare Souza, I will jump on that. Uh, Hall's a guy that's actually living in his gym right now. This will be his second fight since he switched teams, and it's become his actual home. So I am, uh, I think that is working out well for him, and I'm excited to see how he can put that to use. Well, he could not have picked a better time to do that. That is outstanding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that is Barry Cohen. Uh, again, he is a writer for Number Fire. Make sure you check out Barry on Twitter at ScaryBarry4. Barry, we appreciate all the insights, uh, talking some UFC with us. Enjoy the fights on Saturday, and good luck with all your bets. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to have sports back, and I love being on with you guys. We appreciate it. Thank you, Barry. Covering the future. One big thank you once again to Barry Cohen for swinging by and breaking down UFC. And Ed, UFC is really interesting, and there are like so many factors to consider. And like that's true for a lot of sports, but I find it more fascinating to discuss those factors in sports I don't know. And UFC very much qualifies because I'm very squeamish and it's hard for me to watch it uh, just because I'm, again, very squeamish. But it's interesting to hear about all those different factors that go into it for a sport that I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm a big boxing fan and, you know, there's, again, like I mentioned, like the the idea of like a big hitter versus someone who really knows how to box and knows the nuances of the sport. And then you consider something like UFC and there's just so many other factors beyond simply the boxing element of it. Uh, in terms of wrestling and takedowns and submissions and and things like that. Um, I've watched a couple of UFC fights, but yeah. never really immersed myself into it. So, so it'll be interesting to, to, to get into it this weekend and, and uh, try to appreciate the multifaceted nature of the, the sport. Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I've watched it when I've like been out at a bar or something like that and it's been on. And like, it's fun to watch. I just, again, I can't because I'm so like squeamish um i would i think that like hearing barry talk about how some of the guys are like wrestlers is intriguing because high school wrestling is kind of like an art i guess like i used to have to call high school wrestling at my old my old job when i did um when i worked in radio i'd have to like do play by play and like you kind of get to love it really quickly because it is it's like a dance it's it's art it's artistic um it's really fun to watch so yeah. maybe that element, uh, if I can find some fights that skew more that direction, I could really get into it. But um, I'm more intrigued well, about watching it now that I know, have a, a more baseline level of knowledge about it, I guess. Too. Are you squeamish about a guy just getting hit so hard in the face that... Y- yeah, wild, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. No, I was just, I was just wondering. I mean, like, I, I have a very good track record of avoiding gruesome things. Like, I've never seen the Kevin Ware injury. Despite the fact I heard it on radio, I heard his bone break on radio. Didn't see it. Um, I have not seen like the the Paul George injury. I if it's bad and it would make me vomit, I've avoided it. <laughs> and I'm pretty good about knowing when to avoid Twitter and stuff. Uh, if I know things will be bad, so it's a skill. I, if All like right. on my resume, I'm putting that one down for sure. I'm trying to think how to prank you through email now, you know? That'd be yeah, you could make that you could do it pretty easily because I open all Ed Fang things. Um, so you have an in, you have an unfair advantage that, that most things do not. Um, so if someone were to make it happen, I have faith in you, well, Ed. Well what about what about like boxing? Would you watch a boxing match? Because they have gloves and it's not or boxing, I think a big part of the, the squeamish thing is I hate the way like if it's like a submission attempt or something, I hate the way the bodies contort because it's like, ah, right. oh, that shouldn't happen. And like, right. there's part of that in like wrestling too. So like, maybe I could be more okay with it now that I've like, since I had to watch a lot of like wrestling when I was doing that old job. Uh, but like, right. I don't know. I just, I am a wimp. It is I think the the biggest, <laughs> the bigger underlying thing here is I can't deal with it. So well, a wimp they used to play offensive line, right? So yeah, but like, there's no, there's no poking uh there's nothing weird about offensive line so uh Except you get your head smashed in on every play but you don't th- you don't see heads you don't see brain injuries ed which i think is the more disturbing thing we could possibly talk about <laughs> <laughs> with football <laughs> but yeah are you gonna pay for the pay-per-view for this because i think it's int- i'm i'm like tempted i guess it's a business expense why not yeah. can i write off my t- i already filed for 
I guess this would be going to 2020 anyway. So for, this would be for next year. I'll have to I'll have to talk to my account see what we can uh, cook <laughs> up there. Uh, let's move on to covering the future. And next week NASCAR is coming back Ed, and set to resume, and they're going to have a stretch where there will be four races in 11 days just for the Cup Series alone. That means that there will be four wins allocated in that time, which. And wins play a major role in determining the champion because a win gives you five playoff points that can help you advance, help you get to that championship. So wins matter a lot. And we're going to have four separate win bonuses allocated in an 11-day span. So I want to look at championship odds right now and see who is someone who may be a bit undervalued in the betting markets with that, that knowledge that there is a major inflection point coming. And the one that sticks out to me is Ryan Blaney at 28 to 1. If you look at just the current form section of my NASCAR betting model, which is the more reliable segment, um, track history is in there, it's just not as good, Uh, but you look at just the current form model, Ryan Blaney is the seventh ranked driver in NASCAR, and that is despite a poor race in Phoenix where he got wrecked pretty early, and that's dragging his ranking down, but he's still seventh even when you have that in there. He is tied for 11th in championship odds at FanDuel Sportsbook, sitting at 28-1. to 1. So 7th versus 11th, and I think the 7th may be underrating him a bit. And everyone ahead of him in the current form rankings has championship odds that are 16-1 to 1 or shorter. And only two guys are longer than 10-1. to 1. And again, Blaney's down at 28-1. to 1. So that's interesting to me. In order to get the championship, wins will be a priority. And Blaney does not have any of those yet this year, but... He has been close in three of the four races. Uh, He has won at a bunch of different track types, or I guess three different track types in his Cup Series career. So I think it's reasonable to expect the wins to come, especially when we look at the way the schedule breaks down in in the near future. He was one of the cars to beat in Las Vegas, and that's the lone race we've had so far this year on an intermediate track, a one and a half mile track. And Darlington... 1.36 1.36 miles, uh, then Charlotte is 1.5. So each of the next four races will be at intermediate tracks, which means that the strength of Blaney should th- show through. His track history at Darlington is, frankly, really bad. Uh, so I think that maybe you could say he's not going to benefit from that, but I put more stock into current form, especially when it's at a track they only go to once per year, and when it's a young driver, and Blaney counts for both those. So if you're looking for someone shorter, maybe you don't want to go for a long shot for the Cup Series championship odds. You could bet Blaney's teammate, Joey Logano. He's 7-1. to one. Denny Hamlin is 11-1. to one. I don't mind either of those guys, but Blaney is my favorite at 28-1 to one, uh, because that does lock up bankroll for quite a long time. Uh, November is when the championship will, we assume, be handed out uh, in the Cup Series. So I'd like to go with a longer shot there, but Blaney does check that off at 28 to 1. Now, Ed, uh, we talked before about how NASCAR is not necessarily a thing, but can I sell you on it when it's the only show in town effectively? <laughs> well, it's definitely, what do you mean it's not a thing? It's a thing. I mean, I mean like, are you going to watch it though? Uh, well, maybe. Because it'll, it'll be, yeah. Uh, yeah. Next weekend, right? Next weekend on Sunday. And then they have a, an Xfinity Series race, which is the AAA of NASCAR, effectively. That's on okay. Tuesday. I had to pull all the data. I didn't have, because I haven't bet on the Xfinity Series a whole lot, and I didn't right. have any data on it. So I had to go back and pull it so I could, like, make my, my model for it. And, right. like, it was really fun. So I'm, I'm pumped for the Xfinity Series race, the Tuesday, and then another Cup Series race on Wednesday. So Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three races all on national TV, and you're going to have sports to watch. Because yeah. the KBO is on when I am very asleep. So as yeah. much as I'm excited for it, I like researching it, I can't watch it at all. But I can watch NASCAR. So maybe we can get you into NASCAR here in the next couple weeks. That sounds good. Hey, I did want to ask you. So with the Phoenix thing and the wreck, I mean, there's got to be a lot of randomness in that, right? Exactly. So, um, I mean, how do you deal with that in your models? Yeah, it's, it's tough because... When I'm looking at my model, um, it's always going to pull in recent races. And there could be ways to qualify it where I omit any average running position that's worse than, let's say, 25th. Because if it's worse than 25th and you're a contender, you probably wrecked. Um, So I think that that's one way I could do it. But I also use this for daily fantasy and I want to have a measure of volatility in there and safety does matter there from a betting perspective. 
I think that the, the better way to do it would be just to like toss those out. And there are ways you can do so um, within data sets and stuff like that. So maybe I could consider that, but there is some randomness. I think that with younger drivers, they tend to have higher rec rates. Uh, David Smith of The Athletic has done research into that, and Ryan Blaney is younger, so maybe there is some value in having that in there. Uh, okay. But it's it's something that I think is the biggest inefficiency within my model is the fact that it doesn't it does account for recs, but not as much as it should. I think is the way I'd phrase that. I mean, every driver probably has at least one rec a season, or, or what? Oh yeah, like, per season. Per season, yeah. This does not pull for a full season. It, it pulls, like, the past X races and then any relevant races at, like, similar tracks, effectively. Uh. So, like, let's say... So, Blaney wrecked in Phoenix. That means that his wreck in Phoenix is going to pop up as being a negative in my model when they go to New Hampshire, when they go to Richmond, because those are also right. short flat tracks where I, I classify Phoenix as being a similar track. Uh, so, it's going to taint his data, like for a decent amount of time, just a question of like, can I lower the value within that? And it's something that I would like to try to do. Like maybe I could do it now because we got time. (laughs) We got nothing but time. So maybe I could do that now. (laughs) Yep. Sounds good. All righty. Let's wrap up here with quarantine corner for this week, Ed. Uh, We are on to like week eight, I think of, of uh, isolation and stuff. Uh, So what have you been doing to occupy your time? So uh, I really like Oversimplified. It's a YouTube channel. Uh, he does like these cartoon animations of history. So if you're into history, uh, it's really worth watching. Uh, he uh, So he did a recent one on Henry VIII. I think it came out maybe 36 hours ago and already has 3 million views. Whoa. Yeah. So it's, it's a big deal. And they're funny. Like he makes yeah. it, it's kind of lighthearted. It's kind of funny. Henry VIII is obviously a historical figure with uh, with a lot of good stories, given that he had six wives and and all that. Um, and that's about all I remember from Henry VIII from from yeah. high school history class. Uh, but he just kind of brings it all together, tells the story of his dad. Uh, it's funny, lighthearted. And then he's got you know he doesn't have, he doesn't do a ton of videos. I mean, maybe like a total of 20, but they're sure. all really good. Um, last two were like the Civil War. I'm pretty sure I've talked about it on the show once. Okay. But if you, I mean, if you like history, like go check out Oversimplified. I mean, you 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 just get down the rabbit hole and they're long. They're, you know, 26, 30 sure. minutes uh, each of the videos and, and they're well done. And I don't know who it is. I've tried to figure out who the guy is and I can't. Like, it's yeah. just not easy to find. But at the end of one of his videos, he did have a baseball player. Like he used, you know, he showed a picture of a baseball player just because he was making some kind of point, and it was a rice baseball player. Oh, interesting. Was it so Anthony I kinda Rendon? Wonder, I kind of wonder if it's someone like that went to Rice, and if it is like someone that was there when I was there. Yeah. Like could this could this potentially like be someone I knew when I was there? I don't know. Interesting. Um, but oversimplified on YouTube. If you like history, definitely, definitely check it out. Well, I think that that sounds fun because. Have you ever watched, like, Drunk History? Yeah. Like, it's entertaining, but you can, in theory, learn something from it. Because, like, I... It's bad that... Okay, I will qualify this by saying that it's bad that I have learned things from Drunk History, but I 100% have. That's the sure. full truth. I have. Right. Um, and, like, I, I find value in learning while being entertained. And you're not going to learn a ton from something like Drunk History, but I feel like from right. Oversimplified, it sounds like you probably can't, because that's a pretty deep dive into one subject. It, it is a relatively deep dive. Um, the other thing about the videos is that the animations like let you tell stories that someone just giving a lecture can't. So there's animations about how the various forces on a field like would have attacked and you know where where these armies were and things like that. I mean, there's just more that you can do with video. Also, yeah. I feel like education has to be entertaining. Yeah, like it has to be entertaining at least on some level to get people. Um, you know, invested in it, just get people interested in it. I mean, I definitely believe in that and the content I do over on my site. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's, it doesn't, it doesn't mean like every second has to be entertaining. Cause at some point you got to dig sure. into the details, but you gotta, you know, it, it has to be a little bit lighthearted, which well, is it's like, you know. it's like a math problem. Um, right. like if the density is higher, but you consume less of it, the actual amount of knowledge you get out of it will be lower. 
But if you have a lower density thing and you make it more entertaining, but people are more inclined to consume more, mathematically, right. eventually that number is going to be higher than the dense product. Because I can't read like dense books and like I check out really quickly. But right. if it's entertaining and I can consume more information because I'm consuming more overall, like it's just more volume. Right. And I think the, like that makes sense. Yeah. And for sure. And and the thing is like, you know, with, with the, with YouTube, it's, you know, I mean, who knows who's fact checking it. Right. So sure. <laughs> I might be spouting out all kinds of, you know, incorrect facts about history, but I don't know. It's pretty well watched. Um, I mean, it's pretty consistent with at least my, yeah. uh, understanding of history. So yeah. you always gotta be careful with that. I mean, especially on Twitter. Sure. I mean, especially so on much stuff, so much stuff out there, you know, you just gotta, be careful to uh, to filter right, it. Right. right, absolutely. I think it's interesting that like, I don't know, I don't consume a whole lot of content on YouTube. Um, and I feel like I am counter to like my age bracket in that sense. But mm -hmm. it seems like you tend to be more like well-versed in like YouTube series and stuff like that, which I think is cool. Cause like, it's, it's something that I don't know a whole lot about. Is that because right. of like, it's something that like kids consume a lot of. So you've like picked it up like from your kids watching YouTube or is it just something that you happen to like the style of content there? Uh, it's, it's a bunch of things. So I actually kind of planning on doing some more video uh, yeah. heading into this football season. So that's one reason. And I've been kind of studying how people's sure. channels work and stuff. So that kind of got me started. Um, I also just find it really appealing. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, I talked about Quibi last week and, and that show dummy, and it's interesting. Like, I just don't go to Quibi much. Like, I kind of like YouTube and just the the wide selection that you get. Like, I mean, there's a couple of people that review books on there um, that, I don't know, I've been watching a lot of that the last couple of days yeah. uh, to get an idea. I, I don't know. I just enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, my kids are on it a lot, too. So, you know, we right. talk about it. And I guess I guess a lot of, like, more of my YouTube consumption started when my son Eli was starting his channel. Yeah. So we were watching a bunch of stuff to get inspired and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, it's the same kind of, like, addictive impulse to just scroll through YouTube on your phone right. to see what, what's going on. It's the same, you know, it's meant to hook you in with, with, with that little dopamine hit and stuff like that. So in that sense, it's not very good. And I try not sure. to do it when I'm like working and stuff. Sure. Not always successful, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I actually, I mean, just a little bit, uh, I am working on a video, um, okay. to do some kind of data visualization, um, and to explain exponential growth in very well an easy it. way. Yeah. And it has to do with COVID and like, yeah. uh, and I'm, going to tell my story with the whole thing i'm i'm almost done hopefully i'll be able to tell you where to find it next week okay um but i also believe like fully in terms of data and in terms of sports there are stories that you can tell with video and data that you just cannot you yeah. simply cannot tell any other way and it's also a thing that i i also find my very little kids like intrigued in like there's a way that i can like engage you know one of my kids that doesn't particularly like math Sure. Um, I can engage him in a way if it's like a moving kind of picture. Sure. So, so one of my interests is in, in fully exploring mm -hmm. that because there's, yeah. I mean, there's, there's literally two people on the entire internet doing like moving data animations on, on YouTube. So yeah. it might be an interesting way to, to tell sports stories. Yeah. I think that my, like the favorite piece I've consumed of like COVID data was the Washington post doing their thing, showing like the impact of like social distancing and stuff. So um, right. it's, it's fun when you can learn or it's, it's a lot easier for me to learn through a vi yeah. visualization. So I'm looking forward to that. That should be uh, pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, and just ahead, let yeah. me jump in real quick. Like I didn't take COVID seriously until a YouTube video. So okay. there's this guy, uh, he goes by three blue, one Brown. He does yeah. a bunch of math animations. He's one of the two people out there that are doing good <laughs> animations. Um, I didn't take it seriously until he put that video on. I was like, oh, this is exponential. Okay, I get it. Right, right. Stop joking around about this stuff. Yeah, right. I mean, I also was watching that while I was pretty sick. So <laughs> <laughs> that was also the point. But um, but yeah. So that makes sense. Another, I mean, quarantine corner, three, three blue, one brown uh, okay. for math. Like he does some pretty like serious, you know, calculus, linear algebra type math videos in 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 terms of animations yeah um but he's done some he's done some COVID stuff and really good 
I mean, I could use that at this point. That's, I've been, it's been a long time since I've taken a math class, so I could definitely use a refresher in a lot of things for sure. Uh, my quarantine corner for this week is talking about a book, which is weird because I don't read a whole lot of books, but it is a book that is an intersection of of interests for me uh it's called racing to the finish it's actually written by dale earnhardt jr um and ryan mcgee and the reason that i found this super interesting is that i have never read a book that describes what it is like to have a concussion and dale jr famously like battled with concussions uh throughout the end of his nascar career and effectively led to his early retirement the reason i thought that it was so interesting was he described it like feeling drunk um, in the way that when he experienced a concussion, he was saying like, okay, I'm waking up this morning. I feel like I am one and a half beers is basically the way that he would describe it. And I thought that that was like super interesting because I'd never heard a description or like a concussion be described that way. But he has, he basically had a, a notes app open on his iPhone and he takes the notes that he wrote in his iPhone so that he could document it and turned it into a book, which wow. is amazing because, like, I consume football a lot. Um, but, like, when I was in journalism school, I did reports about football, about helmets and things like that. And I, I, you know, it's interesting. It's very good to know. So when I'm talking about it, I'm not talking about it in a super callous way. But it's also that impacts NASCAR drivers. And he went up to a research university in Pittsburgh and talked about the the, uh, I guess, rehab that he went through, which you can do for concussions. And it was really fun to read. I mean, like, I guess fun's not the right word, but it was interesting to read his experiences with it because, A, it kind of shows you, like, how scary all these things are, but it also gives you a greater perspective of, like, what these people are going through and how much that can, like, mess you up. Um, And it doesn't sound like a fun hang when you describe it that way, but it's so unique in the way that he presents it, that, I, that I'd still recommend it. Um, Ryan McGee is the, the co-writer. He hosts a radio show on ESPN uh, called Marty and McGee. He, they're awesome. Uh, and he his, like, his style is kind of in it too, in the writing by Dale Jr. So I definitely check it out if you want a better understanding of concussions, but also maybe if you're just a NASCAR fan and want to read about that from Dale Jr. He talks about like effectively being scared during races um, at Talladega um, and how that influences his decisions. But it was honestly fascinating to read that. Uh, but I didn't realize how much concussions affected him specifically until I read this book. So it was, it was really interesting for sure. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And I, and I like the idea of just like constantly taking notes and like going yeah. back and like stitching a story uh, together through that. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of my friend, uh, so separate thought reminds me of a friend, uh, up the street. He's been making this joke. He's like, yeah, I woke up this morning and I thought I had COVID. And then I just remembered I was hung over, <laughs> so, but the same kind of idea that, you know, you don't feel right in the morning and, right. uh, you either were drinking too much last night yep. or you got a concussion from being an NASCAR driver. Yep, exactly. Um, and the notes app thing is interesting too, because one of my favorite articles I've read was, um, it was Spencer Hall from, or previously at SB Nation, and he went to a baseball game in Colorado, put himself in an altered state, which is legal to do in Colorado, and took down <laughs> notes on his app, or, or notes on his phone about what he experienced at a baseball game. And like, the between inning promotions from that perspective are amazing. So awesome. Find that from Spencer Hall uh, at EDSBS. Uh, it should still be up on the site, but that was that was fun. But I am pro anything notes app being turned into cont- content I can consume. I think it's fascinating. So uh, yeah. racing to the finish by Dale Jr. and Spencer Hall too. Nice. We're allowed to say smoking pot on the show, right? Oh yeah, I just like saying it in a weird way because it's way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather d- dance yeah. around it because it's just way more fun for me personally. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's just like a good content idea in general. Like, take an experience that few people have and is interesting uh, and uh, write a ton of notes and then put it together in a story. I mean, honestly, like, even going through, like, lockdown would have been fascinating for, like, people 10 years down the road who didn't experience it or whatever. Like, yeah. But I, my, it's my day to day experience isn't that different because I work from home anyway. I don't interact with people all that often. So, like, it hasn't affected me. So, I'd be the wrong person to do that. But, right. 
if I could go back in time and get someone else to do it for me, I think that would be interesting uh, in the future as well. That is all that we have for today. Uh, Back again next week. We're going to talk some NASCAR to get you set for all the races coming up there. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And once again, if you like what you hear, please leave a rating and review as well. Thank you to Barry Cohen. Follow him on Twitter at ScaryBarry4. And make sure you check out his betting guide over at NumberFire.com as well. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for doing all the video stuff here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. Ed, uh, where can people find your work, both online and on Twitter? Yeah, I'm at the Power Rank on Twitter. Uh, kind of a weird, a weird and good number of uh, new followers this week. I don't, I don't know what. Were you on a podcast going. or something? Yeah, I was on this podcast. <laughs> I guess that counts. It definitely your own counts. podcast. I guess definitely that counts. counts. Uh, and then uh, at the Power Rank. Uh, at thepowerrank.com. Yeah, that's my website. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, the email newsletter is the way to go there. You can sign up for it at thepowerrank.com. All righty. That is uh, Ed. I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Make sure you follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast as well. Thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck if you decide to lay down some bets on UFC 249 this weekend. We'll talk to you again next week, and stay healthy, everybody. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>